appropriate, um, it's, it's appropriate topic. So I'm talking about the friendliest VOAs, the friendliest and most uh, familiar VOAs. In my notation, this is supposed to be a frac G. Um, this is supposed to be a K. Um, so this is uh, the VOA. This is a simple Lie algebra, finite dimensional over complex numbers, blah, blah, blah. And K is a positive integer. Um, these are rational VOAs. And, um, and the category of representations in my notation will be category of modules for this um, thing will be, we'll just call it C, G, K, where C is supposed to be the appropriate font. I don't know what. And the question that we're going to address is the question of conformal extensions of this VOA. So we want to know um, bigger VOAs that contain this to find an index. So uh, they'll have the same um, central charge. They'll share the same conformal vector. And, um, and so the, if you did the coset, if this will also be rational. If you did the coset construction, then you'd get C. So trivial coset construction. These are conformal embeddings. Okay. Secretly, though, this isn't really what I'm focusing on. Secretly, I'm interested in the module, what are called the module categories for um, these, these modular tensor categories. So these are the quantum group. These are the, the friendliest, um, most familiar quantum group at root of unity categories. So everything here is very familiar. And one would um, have thought, and perhaps one would be right, that there's nothing more really that could be said about these beasts. I'll try to argue otherwise. Right, so secretly my, my purpose is what, what some people would call the module category, understanding the module categories for, um, for these modular tensor categories, whatever that means. So we know from work of Jürgen and Christoph um, and collaborators, these parameterize the full CFTs that correspond to the chiral CFTs that will be given by, um, by this chiral data, whatever that means. And so, so that's the secret purpose. The hard part of that work, th this work result um, concerns what it, what, what's involved in solving it is to understand these conformal embeddings and to understand um, autoequivalences of, of the appropriate tensor categories. And the hard part of that is the conformal embedding part. So I'm, I'm, I'm addressing today the hard part of the module category classification, but um, I don't have time to talk anything more about module categories. So we're going to focus on extending VOAs and pretend that that's an important and interesting thing to do. Okay. So um, this, this question was first addressed formally in um, 1985 or six paper by Gepner Witten. So they were talking about the Vestibule Witten models. They were looking at things like um, what do strings that live on SU2 look like? And so they, they uh, mentioned things like, um, well, so that, as you know, these come with a parameter um, that we would call the level. And so they, um, they understood what we understand, which is that um, 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 the, the category that the, the VOA that would describe this, this isn't the language that they used, but this concerns the VOA A1 comma K and um, the irreducible modules here, the sectors of the theory are, you could parameterize by the highest weights of A1, really it's affine A1 that's, that's playing the role here. And so you can parameterize these by K plus one different, they have, it's there's K plus one different um, simples in this category and, uh, and whatever. We know the rest of this. We know, I don't wanna say anything more. But they also looked at um, SO3. So what's special about SO3 here, of course, is that it's S, U2 quotient by the center. So centers plus or minus one. And so, um, so these are both compact Lie groups, makes sense for the string to live on either of them. And they wanted to know the relation of these two things. And so here, um, the, the beast is what we would call a simple current extension of the thing upstairs. Um, and um, its simples um, are, there's something like K over two of the simples here. This only works in when four divides the level. And um, the simple modules for the simple current extension of this are going to be, if I restrict down to the smaller VOA, um, they're gonna be one plus K, sorry, zero plus K, two plus K minus two using the highest weight notation. You keep going down by twos until you hit the midpoint. The midpoint will be K over two, and you have two of those. You resolve that fixed point. And so that's what the, the the spectrum, that's what the, the simple modules for the corresponding VOA um, would look like. The VOA is one of these things. It, it lives here, it's an extension by simple currents 
of this thing. Simple current, for those of you who don't know, are, well, in this case, K is a simple current. These are things that have, um, that are invertible. So they, so for example, K tensor K equals zero. So it's a, it's a simple current, it's quantum dimension is one, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, um, so the question is, what else is there? Is there anything else? And so this was addressed by Capelli, a certain number of P's and a certain number of L's. No P's um, or L's and Zubayev, same thing. And this is in 1987 or so. And um, what they did is they, they looked at, they looked at um, the module category classification for, for SU2 level, for A1 level K. Um, and so in particular that includes as a special case, this classification, they looked at it purely combinatorial. So you can think about this as follows. You can think of the, for the extended VOA, it's gonna have, a, it's gonna be controlled by a modular tensor category. It's simple modules, so it's only gonna be finally many of them. So let's give them names, let's call them character one, character two, character who's what. And, um, and they're modules for the big VOA, and so we can restrict and also consider them as modules for the smaller view. We can do restriction here. We have branching modes. These things will decompose and they're, they're simple for the big view way, but in general, they won't be simple for the smaller view way. And you'll get um, I don't know, this notation. So you'll sum over from i equals zero to k, you'll sum over all of the simples in the smaller view way. In this case, it's going to be a to k. And there are certain multiplicities that come in. So I call them b's for branching. So this will be this will be b one comma i because it's the first module of the big VOA, and similarly all the way down. And these characters here, these particular combinations of the chi's, um, are uh, have to obey modular invariance. They have to move the span of these things has to be invariant under under SL two Z. You have to have an S matrix and T matrix that are satisfy the right the right properties. And so that was basically the approach of Capelli and Zubair. So they looked at the, the combinatorial side and, um, and then imposed the modularity constraint. And um, what they found is you get another, you get two more um, extensions. So this isn't Gepner Witten uh, missed a couple. There's one at k equals 10. It has branching rules zero plus something, five, I think. Zero plus six, and um, another one has um, restriction or branching coefficients three plus seven, and another one has coefficients four plus ten. And this is not a simple current extension because six is not a simple current. It has a quantum dimension sine of seven pi over twelve or something like that. It's not one, and so this is not a simple current extension. Um, and um, you get all this, and this this makes complete sense because this is um, this is a uh, um, this corresponds to a, a lead type conformal embedding. So VE here is turns out to be another one of our friendly VOAs, C two at level one, and so this contains A one level ten with finite index, and these are the branching coefficients. So there's three simples here. Um, one of them is um, is the tensor unit. And so it restricts down to here. And another one is one zero. And the last one is zero one. It's a simple point here. It restricts to this thing. So these are, so this is that story. And there's a similar thing that happens at k equals 28. Um, and um, this involves G2 level one. So these aren't Gepner Witten type, but they still are very Lee theoretic. And so, um, and this is the full story. So again, I said, uh, as I said, that they considered the bigger problem, which is the module category classification, and they got a very neat answer, ADE. We'll say a little bit more about this later, um, but that's a part of the story that we can't, can't talk about much. So that is um, all I want to say, I think about, oh yes, I guess I should say, they only did it, as I said, at the combinatorial level. So this is much more than that. Just because you have branching rules that satisfy nice modularity doesn't mean that you have uh, VOA that realizes them, and it also doesn't mean that that you might have two VOAs that, um, that correspond to the same two equivalent VOAs that correspond to the same um, branching rules. So, so um, so you have to you have to lift it to a different level. And um, this was done a few years later. So Akhnianu, um, sometime in the 1990s, 
he never, to my knowledge, published um, anything close to the details of the work, but he um, um, announced that he had the, the proof that this actually um, are realized and you get uniqueness. And so where we actually saw all the answers written out was in Kirillov, a certain number of R's and a certain number of L's, um, Ostrich, no L's, and no, and that, this was done in something like 2002 or so. So this is where we have the, the, the proof of, um, of the, that this is, that the Capelli Sun Zubair answer is, exists and, and is unique. Okay, right. So, um, but I wanted to talk more about something. So maybe I'll talk more about it right now. Okay, so our question is to try to understand, as I said, all extensions VE, all rational VOA um, that corresponds to uh, um, VGK. And um, so there's some obvious solutions. These, these are sometimes called quantum subgroups. And the reason has to do with um, ADE is a, uh, um, ADE is a, also, it appears in lots of other places in math. And one place it appears is in the Mackay graphs, the Mackay correspondence, finite subgroups of SU2. And, um, and so in analogy with that, um, um, the name quantum subgroups were given to these, these extensions. So sometimes I'll use the word quantum subgroup. It's synonymous with everything else I'm talking about here. And so there's some obvious ones. And these are the simple current extensions. So these are where the, the tensor unit of the bigger thing um, is, yeah, is just simple currents, just a sum of simple currents. So just a sum of invertible um, objects in the smaller category when you restrict. And you also have these um, conformal embeddings of Lie type. These are things like um, G2 level one contains A1 level 28. So these are, very, these are completely understood. In fact, what I'll say is any, I'll ignore them all. And so I'm only going to consider other stuff. And I'll call these exotic, even though they're not that exotic most of the time. I'll call them exotic. It just sounds better, right? Of course, the reason for calling these things quantum subgroup is you have a better chance to get a slightly higher grant if you uh, use words like that. So, um, so, uh, so these are called um, exotic quantum subgroups. And so these are, these are, these are also quite well understood. Um, they're classified by, um, well, one of the people that classified these is present um, virtually or physically. Um, Peter Belknap is involved in, in classifying all of these possible conformal embeddings of lead types. So the generalization of G2 level one uh, contains A1 level 28 to all the other the algebras. So these ones are understood. And then the question is, is there anything else? Okay. Well, in the 1990s, there were a lot of work done on, on, um, on this um, and the early 2000s, but there wasn't too much um, really concrete progress that was done. So there was um, the only other, uh, um, classification that we have is for A2. So when G equals A2, we have the full classification. Um, these fall into, you have simple current. I'm not gonna, these are, are beneath contempt. Um, and so these occur when three is a divide the level. And then you have exceptionals at five, nine, and 21. You have, um, you have exotic, truly, you have exotic. So this is exotic in quotation marks. Um, just makes it sound a lot fancier than it really is. So you have exotics at k equals five, k equals nine, k equals 21. And these are all of the conformal embedding of Lie type examples. Um, and, uh, um, but, and so there, in fact, there's the module category for this as well. And it turns out there's connections with Jacobi, um, Jacobi and Sofermat curves. So one of the things that, that um, keeps me going in this, thinking about this is because the two things we have answers for have interesting answers. So all I'll say about this is um, you're always supposed to add to the level. If we've seen in lots of talks before, you're always supposed to add the dual coxeter number to the level. So really this is um, shifted level eight, shifted level 12, shifted level 24, which all divide 24. And um, in fact, that's a, a key small piece of, of, uh, of this interpretation, this geometric interpretation of the answer. Okay. Um, and so, so our question is to try to understand what else is going on. Okay, now what do we expect? So we don't have a very interesting answer, to be honest, for A1 and A2. There's nothing unobvious that exists. What do we expect? Well, there's a secret picture underlying um, a lot of the work on these 
um, boring, um, VO, but, but highly structured VOAs and CFTs, or VOAs and module tensor categories. Um, and so there's a the secret perspective is that there's a contravariant metaphor. So you can make functors into this, but right now I'm just going to call it a metaphor. A, contra, a contravariant metaphor between the world of groups, or in fact, finite groups, and our world up there. Well, actually, VOAs, rational VOAs. And um, so what I mean by this is just um, um, the bigger your, your group gets, the smaller the, it'll correspond to. It'll, Correspond to smaller VOAs, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so, um, so we we have things like um, fine, we have things like finite groups of Lie type. These are going to correspond to these sorts of VOAs. These are the rational VOAs of Lie type. These things up here. I mean, there's lots of other ones as we're discovering, um, but um, so we can, we can kind of think of these as corresponding to our VGKs, and. Um, and so what's special, so the finite groups of Lie type are things like um, SL and over some finite field. Now, what are special about finite groups of Lie type? Well, one thing that's special about them is that they're simple almost always, or more precisely, if you take one of these things and you divide it by its center, then, which is almost always non-trivial, then you get something that's, that's simple usually. There's some counter examples, for example, the small ones for SL2. Um, so for Q equals two and Q equals three. So what that would correspond in our contravariant metaphor is these things um, are essentially maximally extended. So more precisely, um, the analog of quotient, the, an the analog of center is simple currents. The al analog of quotient by the center is extending by simple currents. So um, this is what we would expect. Almost all VGK, and probably more than just the VGK, whatever um, other um, rational VOAs of Lie type there are, um, when extended by simple currents. Just like sometimes the center is trivial, sometimes here um, there's, there's no simple currents you could extend by, is maximally extended. So any other, there's no other, um, no other um, VE these things so it is its own there's a fancy word for this because there's always fancy words for this and this is is it called ambient anisotropy something like that so the category would be called ambient anisotropic or some other very complicated and meaningless phrase like that um, um, when the voa is maximally extended so this is what you would expect this is truly what you would expect to be true um, and in fact, that's what we're going to see. And now, another thing that, that's special about these um, finite groups of Lie type is that if you look at the list of all simple finite groups, then almost all of them are these ones. So I don't just mean things like SLN. You could twist these by automorphisms and stuff. You have something like 16 infinite families of, of finite groups of Lie type, but um, 17 if you count the cyclic groups. They're, they're basically of Lie type. So, um, so um, you'd also kind of expect, maybe this is pushing the analogy a little bit further than it should be pushed, but you also expect that um, all of these, almost all of these ambient isotropic categories um, are, are coming from, I'm not sure if this is the right word, ambient isot and isotropic. It's now stuck in my head. So for now, every time I think about this word, it's gonna be coming out as this. Um, almost all of these modular tensor categories will be related to will come from a Lie type. So again, um, these are not the only uh, VOAs, rational VOAs of Lie type. Uh, Tomiyuki and collaborators have been pumping out um, um, other ones. And um, so for example, these categories, you'd want to twist, presumably by Galois automorphisms, you'd want to twist these categories, which is more or less the same as, as um, a lot of the um, Tomiyuki uh, cat, uh, Categories, etc. Okay, so this is kind of okay. So yes, this is what we would also expect because of the fact that almost all, only the alternating groups are the simple groups that aren't connected to Lie theory. So this is sort of a secret little, little thought. Right. Okay. So let's go back to the problem. No, I won't go back to the problem. I'm going to talk about um, 
the modern approach. So, so far I've just talked about the categorical, the uh, combinatorial stuff. And so the modern approach, categorical, or at least it can be phrased that way. And so the idea is that um, 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 each of these, so each conformal embedding or conformal extension corresponds to a commutative algebra, commutative associative algebra in the underlying category. So this is a this is um, a result of Kroloff in the Kroloff Ostrich paper I've already I've already referred to, um, and then um, in more detail in in Huang, Lepowski, and Kroloff, and um, and then the final um, touches were done by uh, Thomas and uh, Robert and um, Shashank. And so what we get is um, a correspondence between the conformal extensions and commutative algebras. And so the object um, that corresponds to your algebra is just going to be the restriction of your big VOA into your small VOA, small category. So that's what it is as an object. And we need a multiplication. So multiplication, of course, is going to be an element in the, the appropriate home space. The appropriate home space, of course, is A tensor A to A. And so in the VOA world, these are given by intertwiners, and the intertwiner here is the only one it can be, which is the vertex operator for the, the extended vertex operator. So, um, and then blah, blah, blah. So that's the, um, that's the modern approach, um, but there's a lot much more going on. And so um, we're interested in representation theory. So we're interested in the um, category, we're interested in the modules of the big thing. And these are all, um, a modules. So they lie inside what I would call rep A. So these are the A modules for this algebra. Just like you can define an algebra in a category, you can define modules for that algebra. And you get a category. This will be a fusion category in our case. And so some of the um, A modules turn out to be um, our, our things here. So this category is a subcategory of this thing. And there's a few extra things. Yeah. Is this corresponding to non unitized VOA? For non what? Non non unitized. Yeah, this is true for anything. So any any rational VOA, and there's extensions to other um, classes of VOAs as well. Let's pick up the speed a little bit. So there's for better or for worse, there's some other there's some E modules that aren't that don't that aren't realized as uh, ordinary VOA modules for the extended VOA. And these are sometimes called twisted. In the special case where your smaller VOA is an orbifold by a finite group of your big VOA, then um, these are called twisted modules or non-local. Um, so these are other elements. These are the other elements in wrap A. What else do I wanna say about this? Maybe we need a quick example. No, maybe I won't. So I'll, first I'll say we have this contravariant metaphor that I've alluded to before. And in this context, what it's what it corresponds to are so these twisted ones correspond to um, projective reps. More precisely, if we have um, so if you have projective reps for some group G become true reps for some extension of G, right? Um, and these twisted modules for um, our extended VOA become true VOA representations for the smaller VOA. And so you have this contravariantness going on. So the, the role, um, sort of the role of these twisted modules is they're meant to be sort of analogous to projective representations. That's sort of why they're present in this, in this picture. By the way, before I forget, the simple current extensions, the ones that we're trying to ignore um, are, Another way to think about them, so if VE is a simple current extension of V, that's exactly the same thing as saying um, that V is an orbifold of VE by an abelian group. So if you're not so comfortable with the idea of simple current extensions, well, maybe this helps. So anyways, so that's another interpretation of a simple current extension. Okay, so um, let's do an example. Um, to, let's go return to the C2 level one um, containing um, A1 level 10 example. And so we already know that there's three 
Um, there's three modules, one I'll call zero, 00. This is the tensor unit for C21. And this corresponds, as I said, to zero plus six. And um, we have um, the simple current for C2 level one. This will correspond to four plus 10. And so, in, so its highest weight in C2 language is zero one. We have um, the remaining simple module um, for C2 level one, namely one comma zero. And this one is three and seven, I think. And it turns out there's three um, twisted modules, three non-local modules as well. I'll call them tau one, um, tau two, and tau three. And so tau one restricts to something that I don't remember. One plus five plus seven. These numbers are just random. I could throw down anything and it's not gonna change anything, but I'll just impress you with my knowledge by writing down some random numbers. And this one is three plus, Five plus nine. And so, so we have this picture here. In fact, it makes sense to do this. So this is the E6 diagram. And the, reason, the, the reason this makes sense is this describes, this is the Mackay graph for multiplying tensoring by the first twisted. So the first twisted um, times itself, the, the um, rep A is a fusion category. So tau one squared is equal to zero plus T two, et cetera, et cetera. So you flush out the E6 graph and in the ADE um, correspondence, this, this indeed corresponds to E6. And similar, a similar picture can be drawn for, for the G2 comma one thing, you get the E8 diagram. Okay, so what you get is, so you get restriction. So restriction is gonna go from um, um, the, these A modules, twisted or otherwise, down to the basic quantum group um, at root of unity category, so what we're calling CGK. And um, there's an adjoint or a transpose to this thing. So the gentlest word would be transpose because the matrix that describes this linear map, um, if you take its transpose, you get the matrix that describes this linear map. And this is the adjoint functor here. And what you'd like in the case of finite groups, this thing lands in the representations of the bigger um, for the bigger group, but here it overshoots and you end up with twisted things as well. So we can't avoid twisted reps. They're present thanks to this induction functor. And um, because of this quadrivariant functor, in the finite group setting, the restriction map is the tensor functor. So for example, the dimension of the tensor products is the product of the dimensions. But in, the world, in this quadrivariant world here, induction is the tensor functor. Um, and not restriction. So induction is a really important thing, I think, in this context that probably isn't, hasn't been exploited enough. And, um, and that's the key to um, the progress, the recent progress that's been made. So let's go back to our um, problem. Um, so our problem is to try to understand the conformal extensions of these uh, rational VOAs of Lie type. And there's a breakthrough that happened in um, well, 2018, um, a paper by um, Andrew Shukrai. I don't know, something like this. And you say it's something like Shukrai as well. Um, but uh, anyways, um, yeah, a, a, a real breakthrough happened in his PhD thesis. Um, and what he did was, so as I said, there was very little progress made really in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s in spite of quite a bit of work. This is a why, isn't it? Um, and uh, um, this changed in 2018. So what Andrew found was there exists a bound for C2 and there exists a bound for G2 such that if K is greater than these bounds, um, so C2, for example, then um, C, C2, K, has no exotic extensions, has only simple current extensions. And, and so his, and his proof, he didn't work out the details, but, the, but um, you'd expect that similar arguments would give a bound for any Lie algebra. And so, so this is great. I mean, this um, makes the problem a finite problem. Unfortunately, it's just barely finite. So the K for um, C2 is something like 20,000. 
and for G2, it's only 18 million. But um, you know, nevertheless, um, this is a, a major result. So you have um, so there is a, there is a bound such that you only the only place where you can have exceptional stuff happening is below this bound. So there's some finite number um, which is in principle computable, and so probably so I, I think probably Akbianu knew um, knew a similar result, but he, he didn't work out. I'm I'm sure that he didn't work out the bounds for anything other than a one, which is an easy thing to work out the bounds from. So, uh, so I think this is a major result. By the way, Andrew's on the job market. So if you want someone who's, I think, contributed, made a significant uh, contribution to an, an old problem, then, um, well, he's your man. So, um, so how did Andrew do this? How did Akhmianu do this? Well, they used um, a result that I'll call it Akhmianu's Lama. How am I doing for time? So Akhmianu's Lama looks like this. Akhmianu probably called this Akhmianu's Lama, but um, Andrew, but it never appeared in print. And um, so this this is my name for it. I'm pretty sure that that Akhmianu knew this lama. This appears for the first time in published paper in Andrew's paper. So um, Akhmianu's lama says the following: It only applies to these categories here, these um, the CGKs. Um, so choose any CKG. So if your if your highest weight, so you, your modules for your CKG are parameterized by highest weights. Um, if the conformal weight of, so choose any, choose any highest weight um, inside any of these CKGs. If the conformal weight for this thing, more precisely, if the conformal weight for lambda plus lambda star. So by this, what I mean is, um, you can write it like this, I think, lambda, lambda star dot, this is in the usual um, bilinear product in, in Lie theory. So lambda plus lambda star, plus two, I think, two row, two to the root five vector. Anyways, the conformal weight for lambda plus this, if this is less than some number, two times um, the level plus the dual coxeter number, then induction of lambda, so this will be something inside rep A, is simple. It's a simple module. It's a simple A module. And so the proof of this isn't very hard at all. Um, the proof goes like this. So we're interested in the dimension in the big category. So the big category is rep A in this case of um, the home space or really the endomorphism space of induct lambda, induct lambda, right? We want to show that this dimension is one to get that this thing is simple. And then we can just do little exercises here. So we can reduce this to the category that we understand much better, which is um, C, G, K, by restricting. So the way this works is um, you get um, lambda here and you get lambda tensor A over here. This is the restriction of the induction of lambda. These are just simple rules that you get. And you can move one of the lambdas to the other side. So in the, same, in the same category, the quantum group category, you get lambda tensor, lambda star um, into A. And now um, use the fact that, so in order for this, so this certainly contains one thing, it contains um, the tensor unit. So what we could call zero or, or rho, uh, it contains a tensor unit um, with multiplicity one. That's what's gonna give us the one dimension. The question is, is there anything else? So if there was something else, this something else would have to appear in here. It's different than the, the, the tensor unit. And so its conformal weight has to be bigger than zero, but it has to be congruent to zero mod two um, shifted level, two times shifted level. And so, so just because of the formula for the T matrix, the ribbon twist in these categories, uh, you get a gap. And for large K, it's a very large gap between, so um, what you have to have is, um, so if, so if there's, um, if you can't find anything in this tensor product, that's, that's, um, smaller than this number here, then, um, it can't be in A and, uh, and so the largest conformal weight in this thing here is lambda plus lambda dual. And so if that thing has a smaller, um, norm than 
than this thing, smaller conformal weight than this thing, then, um, then uh, it can't appear in A and neither can anything else in this tensor product. And so that would mean that the dimension would have to be one. So if this inequality is satisfied, then the dimension has to be one, which means this thing has to be simple. So that's the proof of Akhmanji's lemma. And you can see that it depends very um, intensely on, on the property that we're dealing with these quantum subgroup categories. So if you're smart enough, and um, Akhmanji and Andrew are smart enough, then you can use this to obtain a bound for the existence of exotic quantum subgroups. So I'm not going to explain how they did it. Um, to be honest, it's I, I've never, I don't understand. I haven't tried to understand it. So, um, um, so what I want to do is, is do a better job at this. So I want to, knowing that you can do this, I want to come up with a better, um, a better bound. And so the key for um, a key observation that I did, a key thing that I was able to do was to bring in um, Galois plus Akhmian. And so what, Galois, what the Galois symmetry is, I don't think anyone's mentioned it yet. So if you have um, the, S matrix for any modular tensor category, these lie in some cyclotomic field. The order of the simple of the of the cyclotomic field is the order of the, the T matrix, um, the modular T matrix, ribbon twist um, appropriately normalized. And um, and so you hit this with any Galois automorphism inside the cycle of inside for, for a Galois automorphism for that cyclotomic field. And what you get is a weird property. Um, so what you get is a sign. So this is plus or minus one, and you get um, another S matrix entry. So each of these Galois automorphisms commutes the the simples, and uh, you get something like this. This holds for any modular tensor category, but as usual, anything involving Lie theory is much prettier. You have connections with geometry, and for this Galois action here, both the sign and this permutation, there's a geometric interpretation of what's going on. And so these cyclotomic um, actions are given by, as you know, I'm sure, some, um, some integer L co-prime to the, the conductor of your cyclotomic field. And this thing here is related to, so lambda sigma is essentially L times lambda. So this is gonna move you way outside the L curve. Really it's L plus, L times the shifted weight and then unshifted. But anyways, this is going to take you well outside the L cove. And so you have to vial reflect it, use the affine vial group to reflect it back into your L cove. And that's what's going on here. So it's a very geometric picture. Um, okay, why is this important? Well, um, if you have any um, anything that commutes with um, the with um, S and T, any modular invariant with rational coefficients, then an easy calculation that I won't do so you use the fact that um, SS star equals this thing here, you use this fact. So um, if you apply um, sigma to this thing here and use the fact that sigma is going to commute with um, star because everything's in a cyclotomic field, it's an abelian extension, then what you end up with is um, up to a sign, you get another element in your modular invariant. The modular invariant here is going to be something like your branching rules times your branching rule transpose. That's what Z is going to look like in our case. But more generally, anytime you have something that commutes with um, the S matrix, you're going to get, you can exploit, a, there's going to be a symmetry that's there. So you're going to get a sigma and a sigma here. And this sign is going to be the product of the two um, epsilons. Okay. Um, and so, um, so in particular, what this is telling us is the tensor unit, the zero highest weight, um, Galois shifted it because of this formula here. It's not always going to be, in fact, it's rarely going to be back to the tensor unit. It's going to move around. But what it's going to be is it's it's local, or more precisely, it's the restriction. It's in exactly one um, restriction of a local A module, right? Because it appears. So in that case, these things cancel and you get a one in the special case that this is zero, zero. So um, it appears in exactly one, but who cares, at least one um, local A module. And um, how can we use that? Well, um, we're gonna couple this with, with Akhmiani's lemma. So um, we know that this thing here, so usually, so if I was small enough, then we have a formula for, um, for the Galois associate. This formula is gonna be L minus one, L minus one, in terms of Dinkin labels. 
So you are, it is an arbitrary commutative algebra. What, what a is here it? is an arbitrary commutative algebra. Yeah. And so the Galois image of the unit object is going to be like in, in contained in any. It'll be, so the image of the Galois thing will have to be contained in one of the other um, blocks, one of the other restrictions of of the of the local modules, local A modules. Uh huh. For, for any algebra to for any there. algebra a that has to okay. hold and mm -hmm. that applies that isn't a lee theoretic statement that holds for any for any um, logic tensor category as well mm -hmm. right so um so we have a formula for this thing at least if l is small enough and if l is small enough then we can plug it into this formula somewhere Akhnianu's lemma formula we have this inequality here and um you're going to get some l squared so it's going to be some um, some L squared thing. Something that grows like L squared has to be less than. So if L is less than the square root of the level, roughly, then um, if L is small enough, so if L is small compared to um, square root of the level, then Octianu's lemma applies. And so what you end up with is that um, the um, induction of our orbit of uh, our Galois associate of the tensor unit um, is going to be is simple and local. So you had to be smart in order to exploit the fact that the induction of lambda is simple. You don't have to be smart to exploit the existence of an induction that's both simple and local. This is a deadly thing for uh, a community of algebra. In fact, it can't exist. You can't have a community of algebra. You can't have an exotic community of algebra if this happens. So what you get is this is this bound. Up here, Islam can be strengthened. So I'm just stating it in the easiest form here. And the right down here can be strengthened. I'm just stating it in its easiest form. So this is where I get my bound. And there's there's other, yeah, this is where I get my bound. So let P be the smallest prime, co-prime to Fg times um, the level plus the dual coxeter. So um, FG is either one, two, or three, depending on your the algebra. So um, G two is three, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's one of these numbers. So you want to find some prime that's co prime to this. Um, if this prime turns out to be small enough, if it's small compared to the level, so the precise formula, if you plug it into Octavianus' lemma, is this: six times k plus the dual coxeter divided by um, the dual coxeter times the dimension of your algebra plus a fourth. So if it turns out that that um, this is true, then there's no exotic quantum subgroup or um, for our categories or quantum group categories. So you only have simple current extensions. Um, and so, as I say, you can. This is uh, the the cleanest form of it. There's a strength strengthening of it where you we can you weaken that inequality that has to be obeyed. And there's other conditions as well that you have. But this alone is enough to get a, a pretty good bound on um, on um, on where exotic subgroups live. So to see how to use this, let's look at a two. Let's say a two, and let's choose um, k to be even and bigger than some number. I think bigger than or equal to six works. Then let's see how to use this thing. Well, um, FG equals one for A2. And so um, so we need to find something co-prime to nine. So P has to be co-prime to nine. So of course we're gonna take P equals two for any of these levels. And we plug it into this formula and we see what we get. We get that two is less than, actually, I'm not gonna plug it into this formula. It turns out that amazingly this checks out. And so any even K that's at least six is ruled out. It cannot have an exotic um, uh, quantum subgroup. And um, you know you, you continue on down and eventually you have that uh, uh, these numbers when they get big enough, they have to have one they have to have at least one small prime dividing them and so it's eliminated. So that's how you get your bound. And so in fact you can so um, this together with um, the other bounds, what you get is the following. you get to exist a bound okay for any G. You get a bound. This bound um, grows like the rank cubed. I'll give some examples shortly. It grows like the rank cubed, um, but um, there's lots of gaps, as you see. So, for example, every even level is, is eliminated from here. And so, the, the total number of bad levels that have to be explored by other methods um, grows like the rank squared. So, let me give some numbers just to show you that this isn't a totally um, trivial thing. So let's do um, 
So let's do G2. So G2, it turns out the only levels that survive are levels three and four. And so remember we had the bound, so you get a bound of four here. And this was 18 million if you use just the Akhmianu's lemma thing. And for, um, for C2, it's a little bit worse. It's a uh, three, seven, 12. Um, for um, A6, just to jump to some bigger examples, you get um, 36 um, bad levels and you get the highest one, the worst one is 173. This is the, the worst level, the worst bad level. And you know, to give another one, I have, I've worked this out for, and so you have, for B6, you have 22 bad levels and the highest one is 79, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, not, these are small numbers. So these are completely practical numbers. And so I used this to, um, to complete the classification of, to, the explicit classification of um, conformal extensions for any rank up to and including six. So E6, et cetera. And so I have the full answer. So I'm running out of time, but can I just quickly spell up the, oh, can I quickly save the, the punchline sort of? Very quickly. And so um, just, just to tell you the answer, um, so for all algebras of dimension of rank, less than or equal to six, there's a total of 79, I think, 75 exotic. Remember, exotic just means it doesn't contain a simple current extension. There's usually many simple current extensions. There's only 75 that don't involve um, exotic extensions. Almost all of these, 59, are conformal embeddings of lead type. And a few more, six of them, are um, simple current extensions of conformal embeddings. So these are really, really should be added into this list probably. And um, you have some um, mirror extensions or um, um, the punchline is that um, there's really only six or seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's really only seven that you could call truly exotic. Um, and these correspond to A7, A6 level seven, um, C4 level 10, um, D4 level 12, D5 level 8, um, E6 level 4, and F4 level 6. So these are it. So really, the, this is uh, right. And so, um, so I'll stop there. I'm over time, so I should stop there. It's time for questions. Uh, so is it possible to extend this to semi-simple Algebras. Yeah, so there's um, exactly, certainly you can. So in fact, that was my original intention for my paper to do A1 plus A1, just to show people how to do that. But uh, my paper's already 80 pages long, so I have to stop. But um, yeah, so there's there's Gursat's lemma, if you know, uh, for um, subgroups of tensor product, of direct products of, of, of groups. So it parameterizes all of these and the analog of that applies here. So if there's a, there's a known theorem that talks about um, what the community of algebras look like for for Deline products of, of um, <clears throat> other ones, and um, Deline products correspond to semi-simple. Okay. So you think it might be affected? So, so a lot of these examples are, these look like these kind of Shellikens lists. Exactly. In fact, right? it, conveniently for me, they all they all appear on the Shellikens list. So I don't need to prove the existence of these things. I get it from all the hard work that people did on the Shellikens list thing. Hmm. C equals 24 holomorphic BOAs. Uh, so somehow these... Right, so this doesn't give uh, existence. This, but I get existence from VOA. So my work doesn't, what it does is it just says uh, you what cannot have the outside this list and then you yeah, have to prove yeah. uniqueness and existence on your own. But yeah. thankfully, um, by the way, so, uh, these I do have methods though that could have established the existence of some of the Shalikens list VOAs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I don't need to. All right. So can you give a hint how you construct this truly exotic ones? The which ones? Sorry? The truly exotic ones, the seven. Right. So, um, so, so the easiest one, I can give you in full detail the easiest one. The easiest one is this one. So um, the key is, um, so VOAs tell me how to do this. So there's, a, so as you know, there's a, a classification of central charge 24 holomorphic um, VOAs. So these are, holomorphic just means that the category of modules is that. So there's no, there's only, the only simple module is itself. And, um, and so this, 
um, has largely been, so Shalikens back in 1990 or so, um, wrote down a conjectural list of 71 of these things. So the moonshine module is one of them. And then over the years, the DOA community has um, established the existence and uniqueness of everything on this list, except for the moonshine module. I mean, it exists, but we don't know if it's unique yet. And so one of the ones on Shalikens list is this one. So, so I know that um, there's a, there's a, a, there's a community of algebra that exists that has that does what I want it to do. Um, these other ones are there'll be something on Shalikens list. I don't remember the exact one, but some people in this room will that has C four level ten. So it'll be C four level ten, and then there'll be a few other. Um, um, uh, you know, I'll just invent some numbers. And you just have a bunch of other um, things that are direct summed, or in, in this case, tensor producted together. And so. And, and there'll be so this will be on Shalikens list. So some there'll be some community of algebra in the Berlin product of the appropriate um, quantum group categories that gives you VAC. And then then you can use um, you know, then you just restrict to the to the so we're interested in this one. So you just look at the part of that algebra that lives in here. So it's here um, tensor one 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 one, and then that's going to be uh, an Ital algebra for this thing here. So I, I know that it's going to give me a there's going to be a VOA, a rational VOA that corresponds to this. And I also know what its category of modules is going to be. It's going to be um, the, the reverse of the one corresponding to the rest of it. So, so sometimes that's really convenient because this is going to be a weird, exotic thing. I don't know really what its representation theory looks like, but this will generally be nice. And so that's how it. Uh, do you think there will be any families of exotic extensions? Um, that's a that's a good question. So um, in a way, there are, uh, namely the ones of, of Lie types, of course. So these ones fall into, for example, for the A series, you have these three, um, these three that go off to infinity. As far as the other ones go, um, you know, it's pretty sparse. You, maybe you need to push this a little bit further to start seeing a pattern. But, you know, there aren't very many examples. Like the A series has only, it's, so it's possible that these patterns will have non-exotic ones earlier on, and then it starts to get exotic. I think, I don't, I don't know. It's, it seems pretty damn hard to get, uh, to become a, to be a community of algebra in one of these quantum group categories for reasons that I, that I think are understandable, namely this contravariant business. So I think probably there aren't. So this, um, these bad levels are the places where you could potentially yeah. have. Yeah. So, um, so presumably this isn't sharp. You have to do something more to maybe. Yeah, that's right. So this isn't, this is enough to get a, an, a bad level growing on the order of the rank rank uh, rank cubed plus epsilon for any epsilon. So so this is all as I've stated it here. But there's there's much stronger things that are going on. So that where you tighten things a lot. Yeah, I see. And so then like you know a six level one hundred and seventy three, you have to have some technique for yeah, eliminating this one. For doing that. And so the 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 best technique is using this Galois symmetry. So um, it's very fast. So what you get from something I've erased is um, if you ever have so if you have something. So you get a condition, you get a constraint on anything that's going to appear in, for example, so if, if um, in your extension, so if, if in A you have some lambda that appears in A, then what you have to have are these, these parities, just by immediate consequence of the formula I wrote down, these parities have to be the same as the ones coming from the tensor unit for all Galois associates. And you can calculate these parities very easily using the denominator identity. And so, you, so actually, it's, it's does, it doesn't take long at all to rule out 173 for E8. For, um, actually, for E8, it wouldn't take long either. So, Okay, I think it's time to go on. Let's thank Terry again.